thank you very much for attending our press conference today at the Parliament Hill. I'm Gloria Fung from Canada Hong Kong Link. We are very happy to have several delegates from Hong Kong as well as from different cities of Canada to join us in this press conference to share our concern towards the critical situation in Hong Kong. First of all, I would like to introduce our delegates here. To my left is Alex Chow from Hong Kong. He's the past Secretary, uh, Secretary General of the Hong Kong Federation of Students. And to my immediate left is Nathan Law. He's the current Secretary General of Hong Kong Federation of Students. To my right is Mabel Tang from Vancouver. She's the past president of the Civic Education Society of BC. And to my right uh, is Karina Tai, a Hong Kong barrister. And she's also a legal counsel to Canada Hong Kong Link. So we are very happy to have all of them here to participate in this uh, press conference. Following the November 19, 2014 all-party motion supporting Hong Kong and also the March 10 parliamentary hearing during which Martin Lee and myself have been invited by the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development to testify on the situation in Hong Kong. Now the Standing Committee has just completed a two-day parliamentary study on Hong Kong in order to better understand the implementation of the Sino-British Joint Declaration in Hong Kong with respect to one country, two systems, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy, and also to make recommendations to the parliament regarding what Canada could do differently in the Hong Kong policy. This parliamentary study is the Standing Committee's direct response to Canada Hong Kong Link's recommendation made on March 10 in response to the deep concerns of Canadians towards the critical development in Hong Kong. This study also demonstrates the commitment of Canada to uphold the Canadian core values of democracy, freedom, and rule of law, and also uh, human rights, and also its legal and moral obligation to Hong Kong people as an endorsing country of this joint declaration back in 1984. Uh, over the last uh, two days, on May 5th and also May 7th, there are altogether eight witnesses being invited to the study. And uh, they can be broadly divided into four groups. First of all, we have Professor Charles Burton, who is an expert in Canada-China relations, and also a former counselor in, at uh, Canadian Embassy to China in the 1990s. We also have three witnesses from Hong Kong, namely Audrey Yu, who is the founding chair of Civic Party, Nathan Law, who is the present Secretary General of Hong Kong Federation of Students, and also Joshua Wong, the convener of scholarism. The third group it actually comprises Mr. Lui Li, who represents the New Canadian Community Centre, which according to his website has the mission to enhance the connection of Mandarin-speaking new immigrants with their motherland, which means the People's Republic of China. Unfortunately, Mr. Li did not show up and he also refused to be interviewed by media. And the fourth group comprises four university scholars with two from Hong Kong and two from North America. Now, I would like to invite Nathan Law to share with us his response towards the parliamentary study. Nathan, please. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Nathan Law. And uh, once again, thank you for the invitation from the Parliament and uh, the support of the Canadian community to make the te testimony happen. And the reason why we attend this testimony personally 
is that we consider international support is very important. And we are just being here to, uh, to urge or to want the Canadian Parliament to pressure the, uh, the Hong Kong government for, for the implementation of the Joint Declaration. As the Joint Declaration is an international treaty which uh, Canada has endorsed before, and uh, we hope that it will be fully implemented in Hong Kong. Our stance towards the political reform proposal is very clear up to this moment, is that we want it to be vetoed. This is a pro proposal which in its nature is not democratic at, at all, and once we pocket it, it may never be changed in the future. In the testimony these days, we can clearly see that there's a lot of parliament members who are eager to help the democratic development in Hong Kong. And I hope them share the same attitude towards the political reform proposal in Hong Kong. We sincerely hope that the parliament will have more concrete actions on supporting the Hong Kong democratic development, monitoring the implementation of the joint declaration in Hong Kong, and helping Hong Kong people to fight for <coughs> genuine universal suffrage. And once again, I'm not uh, I'm not convinced that uh, by the arguments that we are, if we urge for the uh, international support, that that means that we are inviting hostile foreign forces into Hong Kong and harming the inter, inter harming the national security of China, uh, because this treaty is uh, an inter international treaty, and the endorsed country has the obligation or has a. Uh, or has, the, has a say on the implementation of this treaty. So I think uh, it is uh, relevant, important for the international community to support the implementation of the Sino-British Joint Declaration in Hong Kong. Next, we would like to have Alex Chang from Hong Kong as well. Um, so I'm Al Chow, the former Secretary General of uh, the Hong Kong Federation of Students. Uh, after the NPCSC, the National People's Congress Standing Committee, uh, laying down the decision of uh, 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 how the political reform uh, should be held in Hong Kong, it triggered the umbrella movement and also, well, the student strike. Well, we could see that, well, uh, Hong Kong is going through a hard time, and if the proposal to be put in Legislative Council in June or July will be passed, then it will trigger further anger to trap Hong Kong in a more chaotic position. Hong Kong is at a crossroad that uh, whether we could uh, come up with a just and democratic political reform in the upcoming years. And this year, uh, no doubt, is also critical as what we have been gone through uh, in the past uh, few decades. Uh, if the proposal is to be passed in a logical, it means that, well, China, the Chinese government, could, well, decide or determine what democracy could be in the future. Uh, how a political reform in Hong Kong would be skeleton or structured. It is not only a matter of Hong Kong people, but it also matters the world because uh, we all noticed that well, China is now the second largest economic body in the world. How it would be shifted or how is uh, her development path will be ongoing? It will definitely shape the world and it will. It might result in negative impact if we could not monitor. Uh, Hong Kong in in a way that well we could well well really have the Sino uh, uh, British Joint Declaration to be implemented in a, a right way. Hong Kong well Hong Kong and Hong Kong people well uh, we are striving for democracy, justice, freedom, liberty, uh, and rule of law uh, for many years. If Hong Kong could not receive a just democratic reform proposal. Well, we could foresee that we could no longer join with the world to share the core values that the world is cherishing. It also means that, well, uh, the future of Hong Kong will be a doom, and that might result in a, a, a rather negative impact to Hong Kong and also China, because China would be, well, losing her, well, uh, incentive 
to, to further reform or further to be developed into a more democratic state. And I would not see this as, well, what the world should be hoping for. So I please, and we really appreciate, well, what the world or the Canadian in particular to, could do to Hong Kong so as to give a hand to Hong Kong and also to facilitate the world to, uh, to work towards a better future. Uh, Hong Kong people well, are striving uh, uh, very hard in or for democratic reform, but we also need the support from the world. And we are very well grateful that well, uh, we are here today so that we could share the situation in Hong Kong. And we hope that the, uh, the uh, the parliamentary here could also well uh, 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 um, send some support to Hong Kong people so as to facilitate the democratic progress in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. We always ask, why is Hong Kong an issue of importance to all of us in Canada? And uh, why is it that Canada has a stake in the pr current crisis in Hong Kong. Now, we would like to invite Mabel Tang from BC to share with us uh, her thoughts. Mabel. Thank you, Gloria. As a Canadian um, in this country for 30 years, um, I enjoyed every minute of it in Canada, and I'm proud to be Canadian. Uh, with this country, I, um, I enjoy my freedom of speech, um, freedom of travel and uh, we can be elected and uh, and also um, elect and being elected. So it's kind of concern to uh, our community that you know um, being in uh, originally from Hong Kong that we see something that you know it seems like it's a fundamental human rights issue is being taken away from those people who have already have the freedom of speech. The reason why we are so concerned is um, it, it's, it's really deteriorating um, uh, the freedom of um, speech and the press uh, as well. And we, we are concerned. The reason why we're so concerned is um, We've been seeing such a country, a lovely country of Hong Kong. It is a global country, um, a universal big country that is in the world, uh, not just uh, another city of China. It's a um, global city that you know, everybody really enjoyed um, doing business with and uh, enjoyed the travel too as well. As a Canadian, it is important for us um, to voice our concern because we are one of the country endorsing the Sino British Joint Declaration signed in 1984. Canada has a moral obligation to urge China to respect and honor what they have promised to Hong Kong people in respect to one country, two system. Hong Kong people were in Hong Kong with high degree of autonomy. And furthermore, Democracy, freedom, and rule of law are the backdrop principle of a Canadian foreign policy. We are morally obligated to defend these basic civil rights of the Hong Kong people. Last but not least, it serves our best interest to defend the rights of our citizens living here. Hong Kong is one of the most um, city that most of Canadian living in. It approximately about 300,000 Canadian living in the, uh, Hong Kong city, and also about 200 Canadian companies based in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is Asia's third largest financial market. Without the rule of law, freedom of speech, and civil li liberties, there can be no guarantee of a level playing field for Canadian-owned business or personal security of Canadian in Hong Kong. So. This is why it's so important of protecting democracy, autonomy, and the rule of law in Hong Kong, which has a deep and close connection with Canada, supporting the people of Hong Kong in the struggle to defend basic human rights is vital 
in building strong and respectful relationship with China. So I'm here to urge again our Canadian government to stand up to uh, do the right thing and uh, make sure um, to advocate for those people not able to advocate for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much <coughs> for sharing with us your thought about why Hong Kong is an issue of importance to Canada. Actually, during the last two day uh, parliamentary study, uh, there's also a questioning period during which our parliamentarians can ask questions uh, and get the answer and response from all the witnesses. And I would like to share with you some of the highlights of the questioning uh, period. During the questioning period, Paul Dewar expressed that uh, Canada-China policy need to be adjusted with the change of China and also affirmed the idea of Canada joining force with like-minded countries that have endorsed the Joint Declaration in 1984. Mr. Peter Goring also reiterated the inappropriateness of the Chinese Embassy's interference with the hearing in March. And when asked about the impact of international actions on Hong Kong, the Hong Kong witnesses unanimously confirmed that Hong Kong people were very appreciative of what Canada has done for them. In particular, the all-party motion that was passed by our parliament last November, the March 10 hearing, and also this current uh, parliamentary study. They applauded at Canada and also the international community's upholding of the international principles of democracy and every voice adds up. With respect to the impact of international support uh, for Hong Kong on the economic and trade with China, uh, there's one professor saying that uh, said that uh, if you voice out against China, uh, then there will be backlash. However, Charles Burton, who is an expert on Canada-China relation, did not consider there to be any direct relationship between the two based on the statistical research work that he has done all these years. Actually, according to Charles, Canada did better in trade in the era of Sean Kai Chen when Canada was very strong on human rights issue. And uh, with the current silent uh, diplomacy, it doesn't also, uh, it doesn't indicate that the trade has much improved. And therefore, these two agenda are actually independent of each other. Uh, Charles also cited that uh, China has once threatened Ch uh, Canada on Dalai Lama's visit to Canada in 2013. Uh, but it didn't have any adverse impact on our trade as China needs Canada more in terms of the strategically important natural resources that we can offer to China. And therefore, China, uh, Canada has to uphold its principles. Otherwise, we will not be respected. As part of the uh, objective of this parliamentary study, the standing committee plan to uh, provide a full report uh, based on the hearing to the parliament sometime in June. And also following that, there will be specific recommendations being made to the parliament and also Canadian government as what Canada can do to further support Hong Kong. And I would like to summarize some of the recommendations that have been made. Number one, the Canadian government should have an official statement in June before the Hong Kong government's proposed constitutional reform on election of chief executive is put to vote at the Legislative Council, urging China to honor and fulfill its promises made to Hong Kong people in the Sino-British Joint Declaration, and also ensuring that the constitutional reform on election of political leaders in Hong Kong complies with international standards of universal suffrage. 
Number two, Canada should form a multilateral agency with like-minded countries that have endorsed the joint declaration to closely monitor China's compliance with the joint declaration and the basic law, and also send a delegation to Hong Kong to observe the implementation of this international treaty there. Number three, Canada should join hands with the international community for stronger engagement with Hong Kong at both government and civil society levels. Last but not least, Canada should re-emphasize our commitment to Canadian values as part of the three-part foreign policy mix, realizing Canadian prosperity, security, and Canadian values while strengthening our programming with China to promote trade and investment and to address Chinese espionage in Canada. So uh, this is all we would like to say. Uh 首先非常之高興的難以夠獲得國會議員邀請並且講關於香港的狀況那同時也感受到加拿大社區上面支持是得以令到國會上面作公諸個原因都是希望能夠爭取到國際支持那對於香港來說其實國際支持是十分之重要
加拿大政府咧，應該喺六月香港政改方案喺立法會作出誒呢、呃這個表決之前咧，就應該要出一個公開嘅官方嘅聲明咧，係呼籲中方尊重同埋。充分實現佢哋喺中英聯合聲明有關一國兩制、港人治港、高度自治，同埋有關以呢個普選咧，係落實香港所有誒呢、呃這個政治代表嘅一個即係標準嘅。咁而第二點咧，就係、是、加拿大亦都應該考慮咧，係同其他類同理念嘅曾經。支持過呢個中英聯合聲明嘅國家咧，應該成立成立一個多方嘅一個平台，去密緊密地去監察香港喺落實呢個中英聯合聲明嘅進程，同埋咧亦都可以派出個代表團咧，去到香港嗰度咧，實地了解嗰個狀況。第三點，我哋亦都覺得加拿大應該係同國際社會係能夠加強翻。同香港方面嗰、那個即係聯繫合作同埋互惠嘅影響，咁呢個包括咗政府同埋民間兩方面都同樣重要嘅。咁最後一點咧，我哋亦都希望加拿大咧係能夠重新調整我哋喺外交政策嗰個三個最重要嘅價值嘅支柱，就係、是、促進繁榮。啊！加強呢個國家嘅保安，同埋最後一點就係希望能夠推廣我哋加拿大嗰個價值觀啦。就即係、就是、我哋希望能夠重拾翻我哋過往個傳體，特別加拿大價價值觀咧，我哋希望亦都能夠重新重著重起嚟㗎。即、就、係、是、當我哋同中國合作，同埋加強我哋同佢哋嘅經貿合作嘅同時咧，我哋都不忘咧要了解翻，即、就、係、是、中國喺加拿大一啲嘅間諜嘅活動嘅。咁誒，我哋嘅記者招待會就係咁多，多謝各位。